And the New Testament picks up that exact same picture with the, the story of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 2, 24, it says about Jesus that he himself bore or carried our sins in his body on the tree. Jesus took my sins on himself when he went to Calvary, to the cross. And he carried them away. He lifted them up and carried them away. And the wonder of the good news of the Bible is that the sins, which are the, the rebellion, the, the transgression which I have done, is no longer on me. Jesus has carried it. Jesus has taken it away. Well, that's just one concept which describes the, uh, the process of a man whose sins are being forgiven. The second concept here is in the same verse, whose sin is covered. How happy would you be to know that all your failure, all the times that you knew what was right to do and didn't do it, all those shameful sins of omission have been covered. Again, in the Old Testament, there's a wonderful picture of this. In the, in, on the same day, the Day of Atonement, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and poured out blood onto the atonement cover, the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. Inside were the Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone, and above the Ark were the angels, the seraphim, looking down uh, towards the cover. Above the ark, between the seraphim, the presence of the glory of God was made manifest. And there, between the presence of the glory of God and the gaze of the angels, and the law underneath, which represented the failure of the people of Israel to do what God had commanded them, there, in between, was poured out the blood of this first goat. The goat that the goat's blood was poured out onto the golden cover and it was, as it were, that the, the sacrifice, the life of this goat, came between the gaze of the God and the gaze of the angels and God's holy law that stood against the people of Israel, that stood as a record of their transgression, a record of their failure. And how wonderful would it be to know that the blood of a sacrifice covered all of your failure. Well, there in the Old Testament, the picture was that a sacrifice was made, and one day the sacrifice would be made, which would cover the, the sins of God's people. John the Baptist, on the, the day that uh, Jesus turned up whilst he was baptizing by the River Jordan, pointed to Jesus. Uh, and pointed Jesus out to his disciples and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus became the, the sacrifice that provided a sprinkling of blood, which the writer of the letter called the letter of he the, to the Hebrews described as a, a blood which speaks better things than the the, the blood of bulls and goats, a blood which is more effective in removing sins because it removes them once and for all. How wonderful would it be to know that all your sinful failure, all the failure to obey God's law, is covered by the sacrifice of Jesus. God isn't looking anymore at your failure. He's not staring at what you've not done is staring at the reality that his son has paid for those failures. And that's two out of the three pictures that are present here in Psalm 32, and the third picture is uh, perhaps even more wonderful. Our iniquity, our perversity, is something that we cannot hide. It's within us, and it, the Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. It's a terrible thought to realize that there's something wrong with our hearts. There's something wrong at the core of every single one of us. But there is this inner perversity that we cannot disown. And enjoyment, even a, 
a delight in things which God says are evil. Yet how amazing it would be to realize that those sins of twistedness were not being counted against you. That simple accounting term gives us a wonderful picture and I think everyone can relate to this who's been through the school system and had a, their name written on a sheet of paper and underneath it there's been some bad marks listed. How wonderful would it be to realize that somebody else's name had replaced your own at the top of that list of bad marks. It's a simple idea but the concept of having one's iniquity counted underneath one's name is, is all that's bound up in this simple term. The reality is in the Bible that our sins, our iniquity, that inner perversity was imputed, was transferred to Jesus' account. And he suffered on the cross for my perversity. Now if I believe that's true, and I realize that that's, that applies to me, that makes me the happiest man on the earth. How wonderful would it be to know that for yourself? Those are three words that describe what has made you sad, what has spoiled the relationship between you and your Creator. And those are three concepts that describe the process of reconciliation, the process which makes it possible for you to be truly blessed. But then there's one thought here that has the potential to make you mad, and it's this last phrase that David Adds, he says, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Jesus said many people would come to him on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty things in your name? And he will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. The reality is that many who claim Jesus to be their Lord and say they are his followers are people in whom there is deceit, people in whom there's a, a spirit of deceit such that they say Lord, Lord, but as Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord and do not do what I say? The, the reality that's here for us in the Bible is that the happiness that comes through the message of forgiveness that's available in Christ is for those who repent of their sin. The New Testament tells us that, that, that those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That it's not possible for a man to say, I'm following Christ, and yet to walk in darkness. If that's the case, we lie and do not, do not practice the truth. The message of the Bible is really very simple. Repent of your sins and trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to pay the price for all your sins and to bring you back into a relationship with God. Be baptized and become an all-out follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the New Testament command came like this, repent and be baptized, repent and believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a very simple message. It's a very straightforward command that says to you, you must entrust yourself to Jesus and all that He has done. And you must follow Him in, in everything. Jesus said, no one can come after me who doesn't take up his cross and follow me. If anyone wants to come after me, says Jesus, and, and does not deny himself and take up his cross, cannot be my disciple. It's impossible to be both a, a, someone who follows Jesus and who follows this world. Jesus said himself, you cannot serve God and money. That calls for a moment of decision, and I would encourage you to think carefully about these things, to commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, and to serve Him with everything you've got. Discover for yourself in the Bible whether these things are true or not.